Now we're going to start jumping into real estate. One, I don't want to get up and say, why, why not all these other investments? What I want to focus on is why real estate? So just, I'm just going to open it up right now. So raise your hand if, throw out some reasons of why real estate can be a good investment. Tax advantages. Tax advantages. Okay, we're going to talk about those. Cash flow. Cash flow. You're always going to need somewhere to, somewhere to live. Good. Always have a customer, right? Okay. Equity, so appreciation, growth. What else? Capital gains. Capital gains, so more tax advantage, tax strategy. Leverage and appreciation. Leverage and appreciation. Let's talk about that really quick. So if we're buying a $200,000 house, we have the option of putting $40,000 down, right? Or let's call it $50,000 because there's mortgage closing costs and stuff. So $50,000 down, and we can buy four houses or you can pay cash and buy one house. So if the market grows 10% in one year, we have 10% of 200,000 or 10% of 800,000, you're talking about a $60,000 difference just in one year from utilizing leverage. Not to mention the additional cash flow and all that. That's a powerful concept to understand. Do you guys remember when Tyler was talking about the save money, pay that off, get debt and then pay it off and really at the end of the day end up nowhere? Understand that there is a day and a time to pay stuff off. But most people are trained that the time to focus on paying stuff off is when? Up front, because they're afraid of paying what? Interest. I'm losing all this money in interest. And that makes sense sometimes. But the reality is the right time to pay things off is when it can all be paid off and there's enough money left over to have the residual income that can allow you to live the life that you want. So any of you that are like, gotta pay off, gotta pay off, fear, scarcity, I gotta do it, I gotta do it, this is what it means. Pause, chill out, there's a higher priority. I need some cash flow. So that if I'm not working, I still got money coming in. By the way, question. Right now, I'm willing to give one of you here $10 million of debt as a gift from me to you. I wanna give you $10 million of debt, which means that on your balance sheet, your life's gonna get $10 million deeper in debt. Who wants some of my debt? I see a couple of hands, I'm like, how many of you are like, that's crazy, why would I ever want something like that? That makes no sense. How many of you like that? <laughs> Guys, that $10 million, it's worse, you're never allowed to pay it off. So you're gonna keep that $10 million debt with you your entire life. Now who wants it? Oh, right. There's only a couple of people here that get me. Yeah. Let me tell you about the debt. The debt is for a factory, that $10 million, it costs about $100,000 a month to maintain, but the factory produces $300,000 a month. So it has a $2.2 million every year of financial gain. You just gotta be okay holding debt. Now who wants my debt? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It depends, you want an extra $2 million a year? Who wants an extra $2 million a year? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay guys, debt from a consumer standpoint is bad. Debt from an investor standpoint is what? Good. Structured the right way, it's beautiful. And by the way, you want more of it. In fact, your goal this year should be to get way deeper in debt with debts that make you money. Because in time, those debts will get serviced, they'll get paid off, they'll get pay you along the way and you have a lot of money. Is that a little bit mind altering for some of you? Like that is such a weird way of thinking. Yeah. I remember when I hit $10 million of debt and I looked at my income from it, I'm like, this is such a lie, debt is awesome. I love debt, I want more. How do I get me some more debt? Yeah, you should all be asking, how do you get more of the right kind of debt? Does it make sense? Yeah. Very good. Remember I said we have a lot of experiences in real estate over the years where we've learned and we've done some things wrong. Um, the right type of debt is very key in the real estate strategy. So way back when Chris and I started this, there was stated income loans, there was negative amortization loans, there was loans that made real estate look attractive, more attractive up front, um, but not sustainable, not predictable. And so now we're just boring. It's, no, 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 we do 30-year fixed-rate mortgages, we put 20% down because we want to create this predictable uh, performance in our, asket, in, in our asset class, and we want to manage the risk, right? We, we want to take on risk, but at some point, there's a level where the risk, if we go for too much return, then, we, when, then we're susceptible to too much downside, right? And so it's managing that and creating a real estate strategy centered around 
a, a high ceiling, but not exposure on a floor, right? Um, and so the, the type of debt and how you go about it is super important. Okay, so I'm going to throw these up. I think we hit all of them. Oh, tangible. Real estate. You can touch it. You can feel it. Um, I like that with it. Appreciation, tax savings. We'll go through some of this as we look at actual deals. Appreciates over time. The forgotten deferred game. Um, I used that example in the, in the beginning of my townhouse to, to really iterate this point of, of even you have net cash flow every month from real estate, but we can't forget that your principal is getting paid down in addition, and that's part of your return on your investment. You just don't get it today. You're going to get it tomorrow right when you sell and your mortgage balance is lower. Um, and it's important to be aware of that. And when we underwrite and analyze deals, that we look at that factor and, we, and, and that plays into our decision of whether we want to buy that particular house or not. Cash flow, recession proof. Um, one of the biggest questions Chris and I get asked is you guys were helping people buy houses in 2007, eight, and then the, the, the floor just fell out. What happened to everybody? Did everyone lose their houses? And the answer is no. Why? Because we were buying the right type of houses. And you know, I'll give you just an example. Because we were doing, at that time, we were doing real estate mainly in Utah. Okay? So we bought a house for $215,000 back then. It rented for $1,400, and we cash flowed. Our clients cash flowed $300 a month. Well, that house went from two fifteen dollars to one seventy five dollars over the next couple of years. But what happened to the rent? Did we reduce rents? It was higher. No. What happened to our customer base? Did we have more or less customers? Demand went up for our product. Now, if we were buying $700,000 houses, did, did demand go up for that? No, not at all. But there were more customers for our products. Our vacancy rates improved. Our rents improved. And our clients continued to make 6 to 9% return on their money during the worst real estate recession we'll probably ever see in our lives. And now those houses are worth $350,000. Right? And so when I say recession proof, it's we're in control of when we liquidate. So we're never going to let the type of debt that we put on the property force us into a situation where we're pressured to liquidate. We're not going to buy outside of our box because we're not going to put too much emphasis on speculation. Um, it's all going to be about cash flow predictability so that we're in charge. Okay? Plus, that's kind of the for me, why real estate is such a good vehicle to help create wealth over time. Now we're going to dive into some of our markets. Anything to add to that, Chris? No, dude, I'm, that? I'm excited for this part right now because um, we've actually brought some live deals here with us today, and we're actually going to transact real estate the way we do every single day. And uh, how many of you actually want to see this happen real time, live time today? Would that be exciting? Yeah. Awesome. So you're going, to, you're, going to get, you're going to get to watch money made before your eyes, and then at the end, we actually have a little treat. So, okay. So, and this is fun. It's not every day that when we are out presenting that we get to actually transact real estate um, on stage. So before we do that, um, we're going to dive into some of the markets that we're in. And I'm going to bring up uh, Brandon Grain. So Brandon, come on up. Everybody welcome up Brandon. Uh, Brandon, Brandon has worked with Chris and I uh, nine Nine years. Jeez, wow. um, and his specific role has always been on our acquisition side of things. So somewhat behind the scenes, and he's working to help analyze all the different markets, right? There's over 300 main markets that we analyze to determine which markets do we want to be in and why. And he's helped us open up markets. We've closed down markets, um, constantly researching new markets. And when we get out there, he helps set up the teams, the local real estate agents, the property managers, the rehab guys, the home inspectors, just all the different steps and, and, uh, and members of our team that we need on our acquisitions uh, in order to actually transact in those markets. And so I want Brandon to help talk through a little bit uh, about, we'll start with Orlando, but why are we in Orlando, Brandon? What makes Orlando special? Um, give him a little tour of the city and... Talk Orlando. <laughs> uh, good to be here with you guys. Um, so yeah, well, I've uh, been working with these guys for, it, it is kind of crazy to believe it's been that long for nine years, but, and we've been in a lot of different markets kind of along the way. We've, we've done markets in the Midwest. We've done markets out here in the West. Uh, we were really heavy in Phoenix and Las Vegas, um, kind of coming out of the recession from 2010, really up until about three or four years ago when the, when the spread between the purchase prices and the rents just no longer yielded a good cash flow. 
Obviously, we've been talking about a lot about cash flow and how important that is and, and how vital it is to make sure that cash flow and our strategies that we put out are there. So as, as we got to that point in, in Phoenix and Las Vegas, um, when the, and we made a lot of people a lot of money over those years with that appreciation as it was going up, we really started to look for some other markets where um, the dynamics were just a little bit different from what there were, were in the West um, to try to jump into some other markets. And one of the ones that we really looked at and we were looking at for quite a while was Orlando. People kind of were paying attention to kind of what was going on in the recession. The markets that, that going into the recession had the highest depreciation rates, one, two, and three were always in, in whatever order they happened to come up on in that day, Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Orlando. Um, coming out of the recession, the appreciation rates in, Orlando, in Phoenix and Las Vegas came quite a bit faster. Um, coming out of the, the recovery was quite a bit faster out of the recovery in, in the Western markets, mostly because of the way that they actually performed their foreclosures. Um, it's a pretty complicated process, but the most important thing is to, to know is that the foreclosure process in Orlando occurred about three times as long to go through a normal foreclosure from when a notice of default, when a borrower is defaulting on their loan, to when they're actually foreclosed on. That process takes three times as long as it did in the Western markets. So what happened, the recovery in Orlando was about a, two years after what was happening in Phoenix and Las Vegas. So I want you to en envision this. So, right, these markets went up, they crashed really hard, and some markets have recovered faster than others. And what we're constantly evaluating is based off today's market conditions. We can't control that. So we have to understand what are today's market conditions, and based on that, what are the best markets to buy in? Um, and so, yeah, we, when it was doing down here and it was recovering, we bought a lot in some of those markets, but the last three years, four years, it hasn't, those markets weren't, as good a markets to buy in anymore. And we've had eight consecutive growth years, right, of real estate coming out of the recession. So a lot of people ask, well, geez, do I need to wait for it to, to dip again? Or, or, or what do we do? Well, we can't control the, the overlying market, but we, what we can control is understanding each market inside of it and how they respond to the, to the overall market and say, those are the best ones to buy in. So in Orlando, you know, right now when you go shopping for real estate, nothing's on clearance. There's no clearance racks because nobody's losing their houses. There's not this massive foreclosure process happening. There's not a ton of short sales on the market. And so we have to understand all of that. It's okay, well, where's the best market? Well, Orlando, because it went so high, crashed so hard and has been recovering slower. So their track is like this. There's still opportunity for great growth in that market because it's still, in a sense, recovering right from their hard crash. Yeah, and so that market offers good cash flow, but plus growth. Chris? Now, before we go a little bit deeper and have Brandon explain this market, here's the big picture I want you to understand. When you got no money or you got little money, I want you to be doing real estate in your backyard because that's where you put in the swag equity, you put in the time, you put in the energy, you put in the effort, you find yourself a great deal. And in your backyard, if you meet our criteria, you're good to go. But once you start saying, hey, Chris, I want to create a multi-million dollar machine and system that can actually keep making money for me, and I no longer want to put the time in. How many of you think at some point you might want to graduate from saying, I don't want to put the time personally, and I want to leverage people, I want to leverage systems, I want to leverage that stuff. When you get into that game, what we're talking about now is if you're going to go use that system, don't go to your backyard. Because with 324 markets, if there's three or four that are the best at any given moment, where would you want to buy? So a buddy of mine was talking this morning, he's like, Chris, I'm from New York. I could probably go to Newark. I've gotten to go outside. I get those lower price ranges. Should I do that? And I said, if you got little, no money, yes. But if you got something, 401k, IRA, home equity, and it's not growing the way you want, now you want to transfer that money and go into the most intelligent market where you actually can have the greatest gains. Does this make sense? You want to have the track record, the greatest gain. So when they say Orlando, here's what I want you to understand. Don't see Orlando. See top growth market out of 324 markets that meets all the macro and microeconomics for maximum growth. Does this make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. One more thing I'm going to add to that is uh, a lot of, we talk about investing in your backyard or 
um, access to real estate agents, and I like to compare it to somebody's stock portfolio. If you're buying stock and you call your financial advisor, say, okay, I live in Salt Lake City, and I want you to create a portfolio for me of the best performing stocks with headquarters within 30 minutes of, my, of where I live. Who does that, right? Nobody would buy Apple stock if that was the case, right? But that's how most people invest in real estate because they're limited. Because real estate agents typically are experts in a 30 to 45 mile radius, and that's it. That's as far as their reach is. And when we first started, that's how we started. One of the things we learned was, well, let's knock down those barriers and let's, let's, let's have access to every single market, to every single stock or company that's available out there and be able to identify which ones are best. And, right? the reality and then offer is, that to our clients. And the reality is that's scary unless you have a team doing volume. Correct. Because by the way, how you win in real estate, it, you win by volume. You win by what? Because by the way, let's say, Craig, you want to go out to Florida and you're like, I'm going to call, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call me up an agent out there in Orlando. Let's go get me a house. And you get yourself a house in Orlando and you're one guy. So you come to the property manager you're like, yeah, I'm going to follow Chris's system. I want to rent that for five years uh, and then I'll sell it and see how we do. The property manager, does he know your name? No. Why not? Just it's just you. And how much are you worth to him every month? About a hundred bucks. How much loyalty do you, can you command for a hundred bucks? When it comes time to getting results, does loyalty matter? Yes. But what if you were one of 500 homes and you got the bosses over here that have the relationship with them and all of a sudden they're like, oh, 10% property management? How about 8%? 7 6% because you're giving us that much. And when you call and have a problem, we pick up that phone because if we don't, what might we risk? Yep. Okay, Brandon, Orlando. Right. So jumping back into kind of more of those that kind of macro reasons for why we were why we really liked Orlando. Um, looking at the numbers kind of up there on the on the orange part, I mean, obviously the one that kind of jumps off the page is that 11% appreciation rate. I mean, that's fantastic, right? Um, all across the country, there's a lot of hot markets, but why we re really focus on Orlando is one, the population growth, which is so far above what the normal uh, national averages are. Um, you know, at seven, you know, basically almost about 3% annually. So I think usually even a little bit higher than that. The national average in most states is, is especially in a lot of the other markets, uh, Midwestern markets is basically flat. So population growth is really the, the, the main engine that's kind of driving that economy is the number of people that are coming in, homes being constructed, businesses that are there. Brandon, where are these people coming from? Why is it growing? New York. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mostly. Why New York? Because it's What's cold happening? and taxes are really, really high. You know what I like to say is that in New York or the Northeast, they use salt to melt ice and snow. And in Orlando, they use salt for margaritas. Okay? <laughs> so what's happening is you have the baby boomers that are getting to a point where it's, okay, where do I want to retire? Where do I want to live? And do I pay $800,000 for a small house or apartment or something in the Northeast? Or do I go and pay $550,000 for an estate on a golf course in Orlando with year-round great weather, cheaper taxes, all kinds of stuff, and drink more margaritas, right? Um, and then those people, those aren't our customers. They're not renting our houses, but they come and they spend, and they create service jobs, and they create those $20, $30, $35 dollar an hour type of jobs, and and because they're golfing or going to day spas and going to restaurants and they're out consuming, it, it, it creates a lot of growth for all those types of jobs, which those are our tenants. The, the 50, 60, $70,000 a year household income dual workers, those are the people we rent to and they're really, really good tenants. Okay, so that's a little bit about what, where they're coming from and why they predict they're going to keep coming because there's a lot of baby boomers coming. Um, I keep interrupting. I told Brandon, when you come up here, I'm just going to keep interrupting you. So. <laughs> That's okay. All right, back to you. So going back to those, those, those 50, 60 dual income type of jobs, the vast majority of, the, of those people are working at the resorts that are in Orlando. And that's really the main, the, the, the biggest reason why we're in Orlando is to get near those resorts. Um, Epcot, Disney, um, 68 million people visited Orlando last year. 68 million, the and number one city in the country. 
by, by over 25 million tourists. So you think of New York, you think of Vegas, it dwarfs all of those by tens of millions of visitors every year. Right. So tourism is really the driving factor of the economy in Orlando. That has a lot to do with, when we'll talk about this in a minute when we get the maps up here, of what, why we've chosen the specific regions in Orlando that we do is specifically to have the largest pool of renters that are working at these kind of resorts that Tyler was describing about, uh, those types of income earners, um, to get as close to those as we possibly can. That's why our, our, our lease up rates in Orlando are so small because there's such a huge pool of people working at those resorts that are the perfect candidate for, for renters for where we want to go. Uh, Brandon, let's talk about that real quick. Show them where, where do we, whoops, whoa, there we go. So here's a big map of Orlando. Yeah, Maybe go down, down there. Show yeah. them where we buy down there. Right, so just kind of looking at the map up here, you can kind of see the metro area, the MSA for Orlando is up there in the corner. Um, if anybody, just familiarity with the state, this I-4, we call it the I-4 corridor, Interstate 4, goes all the way down here to Tampa, down in this area, you can barely just see the beginning of it, and all the way up to Daytona Beach, uh, up in that top corner. So where we want to be, and where the, the, the resorts are, Legoland, Disney, Epcot, all of the resorts are basically in the southwest quadrant, is where Orlando is. We've done some deals in the past, kind of on the, on the northeast side of Orlando, when we first got into the market, but I think we did three deals there out of the 400 deals that we did, just because the rental rates and the appreciation is so much greater where the resorts are, and that's where the vast majority of the new construction in terms of homes is occurring. Uh, Medical City, which is a $7 billion development, um, is in that same area as well. That's where the vast majority of the growth is coming and where that biggest rental pool is going to be. We do markets, and they're not a lot of them they are showing up. Kissimmee, Point Siena, Davenport, Haines City. Um, the furthest out we ever go is kind of to Auburndale. We've done a few deals down there. But really, this, this portion of the I-4 corridor is kind of our sweet spot and where we spend the vast majority of our time. So one thing that we really look at, and then we're going we're gonna to look at some live deals in Orlando. See that average home price is 238, and the average rent is 1527. A lot of people say, hey, Utah is growing like crazy right now. It's a, a hub for job creation, population growth. It's appreciating like crazy. How come this isn't one of your hot markets? Well, the average home price in Utah is about $345,000 now, and the average rent is 1700. So do the math. Rent to purchase price, rent to purchase price. And so what we do, those are the averages. We want to perform better than the average, right? So our average rent are $1,400, $1,500, $1,600. Our average purchase prices in Orlando are $180, $190, $200, right? So we want to outperform the average and then find the gems inside of that market and Boom. then pursue those. Boom. Uh, we're going to take a break for a moment to acknowledge an individual who's having a birthday today. And so there for the go. birthday, we're going to give him a house. <laughs> Brent Diane Higby. Brent, get up here, guys. The birthday boy. How are you doing? Awesome. Happy birthday. Check out this guy. What you doing for your birthday? I give myself the gift of knowledge, proximity, power, growth, and real estate. I love that. That's really awesome. Now, by the way, you see that the Higbees actually just bought their first property with me two days ago. That's right. Guys, give them up for that. That's really awesome. Okay, so guys, I want to tell you about this property with Tyler. I want you guys to look at this Performa. So you guys just bought already a property in Florida. Let me tell you about this one. You look at the picture. Does it look like the other one that you bought? Uh, there are some similarities, but... Uh... They're very, very similar. In fact, they're very, very cookie cutter. Um, so if you take a look at it, it's a little grainy up there, but Tyler, why don't you walk through the numbers from the computer there? Okay. Yeah, if you can't see it really well, I apologize. But so this house, um, it's in Point Siena. Show them where that is. Point Siena is right here. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So right in that area that we just talked about. It was built in 2005. So think about the boom, right? And then a lot of construction just halted. So do we buy very many houses built from 2008 to 11? No, because there's hardly any built. And then they started building again. So this was built during that time. Uh, it's 1,600 square feet, four bedrooms, two bathrooms. So it fits inside of that box perfectly. Uh, $172,000. So again, how come you don't buy in Utah as a major market or all these other markets that have a lot of positive things going on? Well, 
you can't even buy a condo here for 172,000, let alone a newer house, right, on land and all that. So um, the rent on this house is 1,400. So again, you go back to those market averages, right? What was it, 230 something and 1,500? So this 1,400 into 172, better ratio than market average. What we're always looking for is part of our underwriting criteria. When we underwrite houses, they come through and we stamp approval or, or rejection, right, on the houses. I want to talk about the exciting number for me, guys. If you take a look right there in the middle, Brent, if you can point out the ROIs, we calculate those in a couple of different ways. When I take a look at my five-year average ROI, I am dead on at 7% cash on cash. For Florida, that's a really high performer. And the overall annual cash on cash with appreciation with everything else on this one currently looks like 29% annual ROI. Wow. Friends, 29% annual ROI. Is it exciting? Wow. Is it exciting? Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. So, absolutely. it's your birthday, so it's your choice. You gotta oh. make a birthday wish. If your birthday wish is you want this house, absolutely. then we're gonna go for it and see if we can get it under contract. You yes, ready for let's it? Let's do it. Guys, give it up to the Hickmies. <laughs> Super exciting, you guys. Awesome. Awesome. So, guys, I wanna help you understand what that means. You guys go have a seat. That means that we're literally doing real estate right now. Now, you need to understand something. This house, is it a really good deal? Is it gonna last? Is it gonna last? No, actually, let me ask you guys, how, how much time do we have when, you, when our massive marketing team, guys, there's about 200 people in total that make this whole system work. When you get to the point where you've found the deal, you've run through the numbers, how much time do we have to get this under contract? <laughs> so this house hit last night, and we'll have an offer out in a couple hours. We're gonna send you a DocuSign on your phones. You know how to do it, you've done it already. Um, and it'll be under contract by the end of the day tomorrow. I mean, you gotta go fast. A, a lot of times we, it's, it's less, than, less than 24 hours yep. is usually how much time we have to jump on these things. So guys, there's a massive marketing team that is actually researching, crunching the numbers. There's two numbers we don't have yet. So the strategy is we're gonna race to get this under contract, and then during our due diligence for the next three to five days, we're gonna one, get the property manager in, because we have a guesstimate on what we think property management is, but we might be off $25. Rarely 50, but we might be off 25. That'll adjust the ROI. The other thing though is repairs. We got pictures, we look at it. It's possible repairs might be a thousand less. They could be five grand more. Usually the team is so good at estimating based on just digital online that they're usually accurate within a thousand dollars. But sometimes we go in and find out, wait a second, there's an extra $4,000 that adjusted our ROI. Did it break the bank on this one? Are we gonna let it go? We got a high likelihood of getting this and, and friends, when you find a really good deal, when do you need to act? You gotta, and, and remember, we're not buying the house right now. What are we doing? We're tying it up and we're getting it under contract. So by the way, guys, for the Higbees, one more time, give them a huge round of applause. Yeah. Super excited. Yeah.